to uh, the live stream today. And today we are talking about, um, today we're talking about um, JVs, right? How do you JV on deals for a massive uh, profit? So, um, and so Miss Jennifer is gonna get out of my way, that way uh, we can get the ball rolling. For everybody that is not a member of uh, uh, Burr uh, Cashflow Investors, make sure you become a member. And for everybody that is a member, uh, remember, you win a cruise for two, you and your spouse, and that's the next giveaway. So last giveaway, if you guys remember, was uh, supposed to be for uh, a whole new appliance set, and we had somebody that won. This next one is going to be given away at the three-day event. So make sure you're there and invite your friends, invite your friends, and invite your family, so that every time you invite somebody, we increase your odds of winning. So people who have 30 people they invited, well, they have a little bit more odds of winning rather than you. So make sure you invite your friends. And you know what we're building to, if you remember what I said, the goal is eventually in the next, the next prize is gonna be a little bit bigger, the next one is gonna be a little bigger, and we're building towards giving away a Mercedes three times a year right? Brand new Mercedes we're going to give away. So that's what we're building to. And this is my bait uh, for you to uh, invite lots of people because the whole point of this particular lives is to give you massive value. So having said that, let's jump into today's topic. And today's topic is going to be JVs. So when we talk about, so just uh, Miss Jennifer, if you zoom in just a little bit in here. So uh, today, when we talk about uh, JVs, why are we talking about uh, JVs today? Why is it so important as a real estate investor to JV on deals? Well, we JV on deals, meaning we do a joint venture on a deal, also known as a partnership, because we're missing one of the pieces. So what are the pieces? Well, one of the pieces is going to be is you need a deal, meaning if I'm gonna do real estate, where does it start? It starts with, do I have a property? Do I have a deal? Number two is gonna be, well, do I have cash, right? Which is, do I have the money? Sometimes you may not have the money. Number three is gonna be is, well, do I have credit, right? Uh, is my credit good? Is it bad? Do I have it or do I not have it, right? Then it becomes says, okay, well, who's going to do the work? Meaning somebody's got to be the person who is the Mr. Entrepreneur that's going to do the work. You need that in a deal because you could have the deal, you could have the credit, you could have, you could have the money, you could have the credit, you have everything. But if you're not willing to do the deal, then um, you're not good willing to do the work, then guess what? How is it going to happen? And then it's the rehab, right? Who is the person that's going to do the rehab? See, the cool part about real estate is this. You don't have to have all the five pieces. As long as you have two pieces, the most critical ones, you can partner for everything else, meaning you can JV for everything else. So uh, if you have a deal and if you're willing to do the work, right, uh, the only place you make uh, no money and, uh, you know, excuse me, you make lots of money and no work is, it happens on YouTube, right? When the gurus show you, oh my God, I made all this money, right? But guys, there's something called work that is involved, meaning who's gonna be the person who's gonna find the deal? Who's gonna be the person who's gonna go out, put all the pieces, all the things together? And that is really, really important. So make sure you understand these pieces. So I'll kind of take you back into uh, kind of how I started. So th this is how I started. And all the business that you see today, right? So meaning literally starting from $20,000 back in 2008 to a $35, $40 million business today, how did it all start? It started with a very small investment on my part because I didn't have a lot of money at the time. I was a real estate agent and this is kind of how I started. I went to Chase Bank at the time and I got a $20,000 um, home equity loan on the townhome that I was living in at the time. Now, mind you, this is in 2008, right? 2008, the market was still going down. So 2008 market was here. You know, it kind of went down all the way to 2012. And in 2012, it started gradually kind of going up, right? Till 2022 and 2022, and again, we see a little bit of a downturn coming into 2023. So it had been up high here, 
right? And it was going down all the way till 2012. It was collapsing year over year. So this is kind of where I was investing. And remember, my initial investment was about a, not about, it was exactly uh, $20,000. So here's what I did. And this is what we're talking about. So what I did was this. I took a uh, $20,000 investment. And at the time, so let's think about it in terms of a deal, right? So we're going to talk about a deal. We're going to talk about credit. We're going to talk about cash. We're going to talk about who's going to do the work and then who's going to get the rehab done. Right? These are the five pieces we talked about. So in terms of a deal, I'm a real estate agent at the time uh, selling real estate. And I thought, well, I think I can find a deal, right? At the time I was finding deals on the MLS. And this we're going to relate to how I did JVs, the right things that I did and the wrong things. And then we're going to go through two or three examples. And you can do a hybrid of that. So what I did was I was going to find a deal. So I was the guy who was going to go out and uh, I was going to find deals, right? So I'm going to put a cross mark by it. How about cash, right? Cash, I had very little amount of cash. So I'm going to make a small yes over here. I didn't have a lot of cash. I needed uh, a little bit more cash to be able to do the deal. I needed another twenty or $30,000. So what I did was I basically partnered on this piece of it. I partnered for this, meaning I did a JV deal. How about credit, right? My credit was okay. Wasn't necessarily the best. It wasn't the worst. Uh, it was okay. But at the time, I was scared because I really didn't want to pull my credit up. Ever been in that position where uh, you feel, oh my God, right? I don't know. You know, I want to keep my head buried in the sand. I was one of those people, right? So I've been there, so I know how it is. So credit-wise, I'm going to put an X because I didn't want to have it pulled up because I didn't want to know the reality. And it's not that I didn't pay my bills. I was paying, obviously, my mortgage, right? But I was kind of late when I used to pay the electric bill or when I would pay the water bill, right? Now, no excuse for it. But that's where I was in my life at the time. And my biggest problem was, I don't know if you are this way, right? My biggest problem was that the extra $50, $100, whatever it is, normal stuff, right? Um, I would pay the mortgage because I knew I didn't want to be like everybody else where they were losing the house. But I was not very diligent on always paying everything on time. Since I started buying a lot of real estate, well, guess what? I am very diligent. The day the bills come due, meaning the day we receive the bills, boom, we pay it out because there's hundreds and hundreds of them come in every single month. So you can't do those games anymore. So in terms of work, 100% I was willing to do the work because guess what? I had no other choice, right? I had no other choice. And so I was willing to do the work, uh, meaning figuring out where to find a deal, finding contractors, um, getting the property done, putting the property back on the market. I was a real estate agent, so I was like, hey, I'll even do the work as a real estate agent for free, just hoping to make a profit, right? But somebody's got to do that. So who's that going to be? And then how about the rehab? A lot of times people think that, hey, if I'm going to do flips, if I'm going to be in real estate, I have to do the rehab. No, you hire for things that you somebody else can do it cheaper than what you can do it. Number one, I didn't know how to do rehabs, right? I'm Indian uh, by uh, heritage. So Indian people, we know how to run Dunkin' Donut. We certainly don't know how to do rehabs, right? That's not something in our blood. So this was something I was going to manage. So this is something important. You want a good investor, be a good investor. You are in the management business, meaning how am I going to manage a rehab? So out of the uh, five things that are needed. Well, guess what? Even if you have zero money, could you learn how to find a deal? Absolutely, right? I mean, that's something that is a learnable skill. But you may not have cash, meaning you may not have uh, cash at that particular time in, our, in your life. And all of us at some point in our lives probably have been broke. And there's nothing wrong being broke because broke is temporary, right? Poor is a mentality, broke is temporary. So that's kind of where I was, where I had a very limited amount of cash, which was 20,000 bucks. So I partnered for this. So what did I do? I had a friend of mine, he put in $20,000 as a partnership, right? So this was my idea was I'm going to buy the property, rehab it, flip the property, share the profits. So this one is going to be a flip 
partnership. So it's a JV venture to do one flip, right? And so that's kind of what I did on the first property. And in terms of credit, I had him basically go to the hard money lender and apply for a loan. So I was bringing the deal. I was going to do all the work. I was going to do all the rehab management, all that stuff. And then we were going to split the profits 50-50. So that's how I literally started. And what I did was, and on the first property, right, imagine this. I made a total of $20,000. This is not just my part. Total between the two of us, right? And I did not charge a real estate commission. So the real estate commission on that deal was three or 4000 bucks. I even for, you know, for golf, I went, I did not get it because I didn't know any better. That's all I thought I was worth. So for the first three years, right, since 2008, 2008 through 2010, I did 100 deals. Imagine this, right? 100 deals, 10 first year, 30 the next year, 60 the year after. In 100 deals, if you look at my taxes for 2010, what you're going to see is I paid about 230000 in taxes. Now, I know that you're going to be like, oh, my God, if you pay that much in taxes, Andrew, you must have made a lot of money, right? Well, true. I did make a lot of money, right? It was about $1.1 million total came in. The problem was this, right? And this is what people don't tell you that when it was all said and done, because I still owed my business partner 50% of that, I had accumulated credit card debts over the last two or three years in 2008, 2009, 2010. I'd kind of done this whole mess. My actual net profit, if you really, really, really look at it, right? My actual net profit for was 250K. Now, does that mean that I did something wrong? No. At the time, that's all I knew, unfortunately. But here's the difference. From 2010, right? I'm just going to put 2010, 222, right? Literally, I built a business that's worth about 35, 40 million bucks. So there was a huge change. And all this time, I continued to do JV deals. So what the reason I'm saying that is this, that the first two or three years, the way I did the JV deals was a little bit different than how I did the JV deals from 2010 on to 2022. The reason why you want to do a JV deal is sometimes we don't have all the pieces that we need to start a business. Yet you look at any business in this world, right? Big, small, whatever, people that are successful, at some point in their lives, they have collaborated with somebody else, right? Even if you have a business, small business, you have a bunch of people working for you, right? In a sense, it's a partnership, right? In a sense, because without them, you can't grow. So this is just on a flip or on a rental. So now let's look at what are the types of deals that we think about when we think about real estate. And before we go there, this is something important because we see this happen in mastery. We see this happen when people attend one of these types of meetings or they come to the RIA meeting. We see this happen all the time, right? You'll have one person that's brand new and broke they'll find another person that's brand new and equally as broke. And they're like, oh my God, we can be best buddies, right? Great, good for you. The problem is this, both of you are brand new and both the people are broke, right? If you're brand new and you're broke and you have tons of time on your hand, what you have to JV with always, joint venture with somebody who has the pieces that you don't have, right? That's what makes for a meaning that you can't jump into uh, a really deep pool and you and your buddy, both of them don't know how to swim. No, no, no. You want to jump in the pool with somebody who's Michael Phelps, right? Who's a great swimmer. So in case you start drowning, they can basically help you get out, right? And the natural tendency of a human being, we don't want to partner with, well, how am I supposed to talk to somebody who's successful, right? How do I talk to somebody who's already got something going on. The way you talk to them in real estate, especially when it comes to real estate, is that you do your part, which is, are you willing to bring a deal to the table? Are you willing to do the headache and the work and the running around? See, if you're willing to do, do those two things, 
it's more valuable, more valuable than money and credit. See, money and credit, there's a lot of people that you can partner for, for money and credit. But what is the most valuable thing in the real estate is it's the deal right? That's the most valuable thing. Now, you can do a lot of different joint ventures as we talk about. It. You could do a 50-50, meaning you bring the deal, they bring the money, and you do a 50-50 joint venture. That's one way of doing it, right? So I started, this is where I started. And the hundred, first 123 deals that I did, I did them completely as a 50-50 deal. I didn't know any different. My self-esteem was low, and that's all I thought I could do. Then gradually, I started going to 60-40 deal, where I would keep 60% of the profit, I would put no money in the deal, zero, and I would start keeping 60%, I would give out 40% of the profit, right? Then I went to a 70-30 model, right? Which was even more profitable for me. If you notice, it's gradually we're growing, it's okay. Right? A lot of times today, people wanna become multimillionaires, but they're not willing to climb the step-by-step -step process. See, initially, if you climb that step-by-step -step process, suddenly you can start skipping steps one, two, three at a time, but you can't suddenly go from a zero to a hero, right? That's not realistic, that doesn't work. So eventually what I got to a point was this, I got it down to about 80, 20, and eventually what I would say to people is, hey, listen, if you wanna partner with me, that's great. I'll do a, six and two, meaning I'll borrow the money from you for 6% and of the profits, right? If there is a profit, because not every single thing you're going to do, there's going to be a humongous profit. Of the profits, I'm going to give you an extra 2% kicker, right? I'm going to pay you an extra 2%. That's all I'm willing to do. Now, why were willing people willing to do it? See, when you're brand new, when you don't know what you're doing, even doing this, most people were like, Andrew, what you're talking about in 2008? Yeah, this is a good idea, but I don't think so. I know an uncle and a cousin and somebody else lost money. After I did my deal one or two, guess what happened? I had a couple of friends that were pilots and they came along. They're like, hey man, we'll put up all the money. Just give us 50-50 deal, right? Because they saw a little bit of success. Then move it forward two or three years down the road, that more, more, more people started wanting to partner with me. Why? Because I had a successful pattern, successful track, and that's how I was able to build that, right? So what my point of this is this, that when you do a JV, there's no one way of doing a JV, right? You can do a JV where you do a 50-50. You can do a JV where you do 60-40. You can do a JV where you keep 70 and you give out 30. You can do a JV where you do an 80-20 partnership, right? And when I'm talking about 80-20 of the profits, of the total profits that you make. Now, whenever you're doing a JV, you have to consider, well, what if we take a loss, right? Let's just say you're buying a property for 150,000, you're gonna fix it for 50, and you're hoping when everything is said and done, oh, we're gonna make 60,000 bucks. What if you don't make any money? What happens to the person who put up the money, right? You have to think about that. What if you took a loss? Now, who takes the loss? Do you take the loss or the person who's putting up the money takes the loss? Now, this is how I did it. I'm not saying this is the right way of doing it. The way I did it from the very first time was, I'm like, hey, listen, I borrowed 20,000 bucks from Chase, right? That's how I started uh, as a home equity loan. And if I take a loss, I'm gonna basically cover the first $20,000. Now, that's all I knew. A lot of people would look at me at the time, they're like, so wait a minute. If we make money, you share 50-50. If you take the loss, you're gonna take the first $20,000 as a loss? And I'm like, yeah. I mean, literally, I would tell this to people. People are like, are you serious? I'm like, yeah, I'm willing to put it in a partnership agreement. And they're like, okay, where do we sign up, right? because they knew this was a no loss proposition and I found way more people to do a partnership with than, <laughs> than not because then the properties I could handle and the reason behind that was I was being way too fair, right? A, a few people turned me down because they're like, you're nuts, right? This just doesn't sound realistic and this is crazy, which now I realize it was absolutely crazy, but that's all I knew, so that's what I did. And fortunately, 
only once in the first 123 transactions I ever did. One time, I will never forget this older gentleman, he gave me money and I made zero. I literally mean zero money on that deal. Glendale Heights, Drummond, I'll never forget this property, right? Uh, and I felt very ashamed. And I felt ashamed because here's an older gentleman that borrowed from his uh, home equity line. At the time, it was, what, 3% rate or whatever it was. So there was not a lot of cost for the money. But still, I planned on succeeding. And here I was. I didn't make any money. In that one case, I went ahead and paid. And it was only three four $4,000. was not that much uh, in interest. But still, I felt I had to pay. And he's like, Andrew, you know, you don't have to do that. I'm like, no, 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 I feel responsible because the three or 4,000 bucks at that particular time would not affect me, but that would have been money out of his pocket. So whenever you do a JV, you have to figure out, okay, what is fair? Is this going to help me build? Is this fair towards me? And is this fair towards the other partner? If you're taking all the risk, if you're doing all the work, then guess what? You should be getting paid very handsomely. So now when we talk about JVs, right, we have to think about a couple different things. Number one is what is the type of a deal I'm doing? Am I doing a flip, right, which is going to be you're going to fix the property and then you're going to resell it for a proper profit? Or am I going to do a rental property? And this is important. I want to go back to the point that I said earlier, which is that whenever you're going to do a JV, you want a JV with somebody that covers the missing pieces that you may not have. If you have money, you have credit, but you don't have time, right? A lot of people are like that. They have money. You know, they're a little bit grayer, a little bit balder, but at that point in their life, they have money. They may not have credit. Uh, I mean, excuse me, they may not have time. So they have money, they have credit, but they don't have time. Right? So they should JV with somebody who can find the deal, who can do all the work, who's willing to take on all the headache because they don't have time. So what are they JVing for? They're JVing for the deal, they're JVing for the time, and they're JVing for somebody else taking on the headache. Right? But if two broke people get together, neither of them have a clue, well, guess what's going to happen? You're not going to do anything because neither of you have a clue. See, there are two types of things in life. One are learned skills. And one are skills, one are things in life that you have to earn. See, learned skills are based purely on your effort and work ethic, right? And then the other part of it is the earned skills, sometimes it takes a little bit longer to earn that, meaning be it money, be it credit, whatever that case may be. So, in this case, if I'm going to do a flip deal, right? When I think about a partnership, right? The right way to do a partnership, and then there's a wrong way to do a partnership. So think about it this way in terms of dating, right? Generally, it would be wise to, you're not going to go out with somebody, doesn't matter how attractive or how awesomely in love you feel with that person, within a date or two, you're not going to go get married uh, to them. It would be a bad idea, I would suggest, right? Um, generally, that's not a good idea, meaning go on lots of dates, get to know the person before you get married. It's the same way with doing a flip. A lot of times what people will do is they'll go out and suddenly set up a LLC, right? Suddenly set up a C Corp or S Corp, meaning they start a business. Oh my God, we're going to do a, a JV deal together and we're going to go set up a business. The problem is this with that. With a business uh, or with a S Corp LLC, so on and so forth, what happens is you have, you're kind of entering a business marriage sort of, of sorts, right? Now, whatever the other partner does in that LLC, guess what happens? You, as the second partner in that business, you're liable for, right? So I would suggest you, if you, this is your first property, I would not suggest that you go and just go enter into a uh, LLC and just go get married in terms of a business. What I would suggest is you can have two separate LLCs. LLC one, he can have or she can have LLC two. And you sign a joint venture partnership agreement. So what holds this together is the partnership agreement. What you're not a member of is not, you're not a member one, member two of this LLC, right? That's the difference. Here, you have a little bit of a separation. Do one or two deals. 
as a uh, with a joint venture, joint venture agreement, and that is a joint venture agreement that you can go and record it at the courthouse. You're like, well, but Andrew, you know, I bought this property. I kind of recently met the person, and how do I protect my position? That's a very fair thing to say. Number one, if you're the one who's putting out all the money for the deal, you should be recording a mortgage at the courthouse. If you don't know how to do that, reach out to a good attorney, reach out to Ms. Gina Diaz. They will be happy to help you do that, right? It's easy to do. Or you can have a joint venture agreement, also known as a partnership agreement, and you can record that against the property. So before you go sell, before the other person decides to be, uh, you know, go sell the property, guess what happens? It's referred back to that particular uh, joint venture agreement. That's how I would suggest you do that. Now, with the rental, it's going to be a little bit different. On a rental property, what are your profits, right? Also here, you have to think about what happens if we make a profit? What happens if we don't make a profit, right? Most people don't think about it from the other end because we don't want to consider, oh my God, what if we lose 5,000 bucks? Are we both going to share it 50-50? What's going to happen in that case, right? Those are things you have to think about. And here's the cool part. If you want a JV agreement, you want... Uh, a JV agreement or you want a, for a flip, you want a JV agreement for a rental property, show up at the three-day event. When you show up, this is on February 24th, 25th, and 26th. When you show up as a part of going to that particular three-day event, we will give you our partnership agreements that we use in our own business. So having said that, let's go back to a rental. On a rental property, what do you have to think about? Well, you have to share the cash flow right? Who's going to keep the cash flow? Then who's going to keep the, uh, in the end, when you go to sell it, what are you going to do with the equity and or profit at that time? How do you do that? Now, the way I did it was uh, with every single partner, right? I, I don't know, with a couple hundred properties in partnership, then I have all the properties I own myself. Uh, but all the properties that I had a partnership with, I had a simple deal with all my business partners. And the deal was this. When we buy the property together, I'm going to find the deal. You're going to put up the cash if we need any cash on the front end or if we need any cash invested in the deal. Most of the deals, we did it with the 257 formula, right? Two years, five properties, pay them off in seven. So we didn't generally have any money tied up in the deal. But they're like, well, what do we do with the cash flow that comes in? I'm like, we're going to open one bank account. So let's say I own five properties with you. We're going to open one bank account. We're going to take all the cash flow deposited in that bank account. So like, well, what happens month two? Well, we deposit that too. Month three, month four, month five. They're like, well, but what if we have lots of cash flow accumulated? I'm like, well, at that point, we're only going to do two things. Either we're going to pay off our properties with it, right? Or we're going to go ahead and buy more properties with it, right? That's it. It's all we're going to do. I'm not going to use the cash flow for my personal use. You cannot use the cash flow for your personal use. That has to be the agreement. That was my deal, right? So then somebody said, well, Andrew, what about in an emergency? Of course, in an emergency, we can split the cash flow 50-50. That's fine. That's only fine. But what I had done was I had covered all those um, kind of, inevitables that are going to happen. Or what about in a loss? Well, in case the rent, uh, the property is rented and we have a loss, meaning the tenant doesn't pay for a while, hopefully we have enough reserves. If we don't have enough reserves, then one of us or both of us are going to put in our half to be able to carry the property and make the payments. So that's how I always did it. And when and if we sold the properties. Now, out of the couple hundred to 300 properties that we had, maybe we have I've sold three or four, even in the last 10 or 12 years, with any of the business partners. What we have done is accumulated, 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 paid off the properties. If we have sold a property or two, then at the end, when we did all the uh, numbers, cash flow plus sales plus equity, profit, whatever the net number was, that net number, we split it 50-50, right? And with flips, the way I was doing it is I would have them put in their cash, whatever cash was needed. With rentals, the exact same thing. Because if I'm going to find them, I'm going to do all the work, I'm going to do the headache, then guess what, right? I get, I mean, then I'm not going to put up the cash. Why would I do that, right? For management, 
we have a management team in a house uh, that basically manages it. And every single month, we would charge the partnership about $50 or $60 as a part of the management expense. So that's how I did a partnership. Now, you can take this to another level. If you look at it in the commercial world, meaning if somebody is buying a big, tent, you know, 30, 40, 50, 60 unit um, uh, big property, then you, what happens is, uh, here's how it works. Let's just say you need to raise $3 million. And if you're gonna raise $3 million, you're gonna go out and get a bank loan for seven or eight, whatever it is, right? So to come up with this $3 million, there are gonna be two types of people in the partnership. It's gonna be a GP, which is called a general partners. And it doesn't have to be one. It can be multiple general partners. These are the partners who basically are, one of them may be the guy who came up with this idea. One of them is somebody who put the whole structure together. One of them may be somebody who basically found the deal. Another person is gonna do all the due diligence. Another person may do management, right? So in this example, you may have say five GPs, and then you're gonna have a whole pool of what's called a LPs, meaning limited partners. So it may be doctors, lawyers, plumbers, whoever, your brother, your sister, whoever. LP means limited partner. GP means a general partner, right? So LP, each person may put in, let's say 100,000 a piece, right? 100K a piece, you guys need 3 million. So you're basically, you have 30 people. You raised 3 million in capital from 30 people, but their liability is limited to the 100,000 they put in. So if they do something else for a profession, right? They're not on the hook for anything more than 100,000. Now in this type of structure, generally, the person who's raising the capital, right? What's called a GP, general partner, they're gonna say, hey, listen, you know, putting this whole thing together, it's been a lot of work, it took us six months. Plus, we had to go do due diligence on a bunch of properties, we put all this money out of pocket, we did all this work. You know, so when we raise the capital, at that time, we're bringing something into our partnership to buy this particular bigger building. At that point, we're gonna charge maybe 1% or 2% of the total money raised as a fee, acquisition fee, you would call it, right? So they may charge that, right? And then that fee, they're gonna split it amongst five people. And it may be five, it may be 10, it may be two, depends on the size of the deal. Then there's gonna be a ongoing management fee, meaning you're gonna manage this whole thing. So even if you have on-site manager, who's gonna manage the manager? You're gonna have a fee for that. And they're gonna take a little bit of an override. Then at the time of disposition, they're gonna have some sort of a disposition fee, meaning when we get rid of the property, and then they're going to split the profits, right? It may be a 70-30 structure. So once the money is returned, it may be a 80-20 structure, maybe 60-40. Depends whatever you negotiate, right? Again, the whole point of a JV agreement is why do we do a JV? We do a JV because of one or two reasons. Number one, we by ourselves can't do something, so we're going to partner with somebody else to accomplish a goal, right? Number two, we may not simply have the time, neither the expertise, and either way, it's okay. But that's the reason you do a JV is depending on where you're coming from. So now let's take that and relate it to a actual example. So let's see if I can pull it up. Here we go. Okay, so let's look at property number one. So this is a property that uh, I did, and this is a property, which was a property on uh, 6 North 618 Watasca. So this was in St. Charles. The property was purchased for 107,000 bucks. So the entire amount of money, 107,500, is what it was purchased for, right? Small little property, three bedroom, split level uh, type of a property, tri-level type of a property. And then it was fixed up for about $21,000. So on a property like this, uh, which is a simple blah little property, I didn't have to put out any money out of pocket, right, at all. And then when I sold it, the sales price was about 195, 
right? When I sold the property, 195 is what I sold it. And I did a 65% split, meaning I kept 65% of the profit and the other partner got the remaining, right? So basically it was simple. They're getting uh, part of the deal and I'm getting part of the deal. So they're getting 35%. I'm getting 65% of the deal because I was the one who found the deal. I was the one who uh, contacted a bunch of people. I was the one who had the rehab done and I was the one who sold it, right? And that's a very simple deal where I bought the property in Pinnacle, uh, which is my company, and I did a deal with them where I split the profits with them. Now, could I have done it where I did a 6% fixed interest and then pay them a little bit kicker on the end? Yes. But in that particular case, I did it where 65% profit came to me, they got the remaining. The profit on a property, on this property, was somewhere around 45,000 or something like that, 44 and some change. So I kept 65% of that profit. Now, you may say, Andrew, you gave out a lot more than you would have. Yes, but that's the deal I made in that particular case. So that one is a, a example of a property that was done as a um, uh, as a flip, right? Now let's look at an example. I think I have another one. Okay, let's look at this example. Oops. Hey, how come it's Algonquin, Algonquin? Where's that three unit building? You know, we have Miss Jennifer here in the office, and oh, here it is. Oh. Okay. So yeah, Miss Jennifer sometimes. So whenever things go right, it's it's me. Whenever something goes wrong, you know, it's either Lori or Jennifer to blame for it. So anyways, so this is a three unit building. Same exact thing, just done as a rental property. So let's look at this numbers. Um, so this is a three unit building in Brookfield, right? So uh, I'm gonna go back and explain uh, these numbers uh, with the whiteboard because I think that'll make more sense. So. So this is a rental property that I still own today, right? So here's what I did. Now, this is a hybrid where I combined a couple of different strategies. So on a rental property, what do I need? I have the front end of the transaction, which is purchase plus rehab, right, plus rental. I have to do this on the front end. And then on the back end, I'm going to basically do a refi and then keep a property for the long term, right? So this property, when this was purchased, it was purchased as a property that was coming from an auction, right? And the auction price that we bought the property for was 120,000 bucks, right? So in this case, what I did was the front end of it, I treated it like a flip. The back end of it is I treated it, I basically kept it as a rental. So the two people that are involved in this deal uh, as for a rental is Rahul and I. Right? So this is a property I own with Rahul in a partnership. So um, what we did is we borrowed this money from Miss Mary, right? Miss Mary, the attorney that you guys, uh, a lot of you guys know, we borrowed 120,000 bucks from her. Plus we borrowed another 80,000 from her to be able to do the rehab. So at that point, what is my all in cost? My all in cost on this deal is 200,000 bucks. Now on this, I had two choices. Either I could have paid Miss Mary as a fixed interest rate, right? I could have done it that way, or I could have basically done it as a, some sort of a, that hey, when we rehab the property at that point, I'm gonna give you 5,000, 10,000, 20,000, 30,000, whatever it is, right? In this particular case, we kept, the, it took us almost a year to do this particular rehab. So for keeping her money tied up for a year, Right? We, made, we paid Miss Mary about $24,000 right? for keeping her money. So what does that work out? For a year, it almost works out to be about 1% a month is basically, I'm sorry? Okay, we paid about 1% um, a month in terms of interest to her. Um, so now my cost went up by $24,000, right? So I'm all in this deal somewhere around two to five. Now here's the cool part. The cool part is all I have to do is go back and get this property appraised. So then we went to the lender, we got the property appraised. 
And here's the cool part. It appraised at 420. So if the property appraises at 420, right, what is going to happen? Well, we're going to get a 75% loan based on 420. So Lori, 420 times 0.75 is how much? Lori is a bloody genius with, uh, with numbers, which means that she can never figure the numbers out. So times 0.75 is 315,000, right? So on the back end, we could have gotten 315,000 as a loan. What? What? I said Lori is a genius when it comes to numbers. And, no, okay. Yeah, because she can't, this is the genius that can't figure out numbers at all. But anyways, so we could have gotten a $315,000 loan. Obviously, I didn't put that big a loan on it. All I did was borrow $225,000 on that property, paid Miss Mary back in full, right? She got her money that she put out. She got a good interest rate on it or a profit, whatever you want to call it. And guess what happens? Now, Rahul and I own the property, right? Every single month, this property, this is a three-unit building. Every single month, it makes $2,100. That's net profit after all expenses. Now, you do the math. $2,100 times 12, how much does that building make? Right? It's more than $24,000 every single year, right? And what we do is every year, this whole amount of money, we don't touch it. We just put it aside, right? We're putting it aside. Now what it does is every year it keeps growing. It keeps growing. It keeps growing, right? Hopefully one day uh, when we sell it or it gets passed on to our heirs, they're going to have a building that's a huge money maker. Now you might say, Andrew, but I don't want to put that money aside. I want to put that money to work. It's fine. Could I take half of this money every single month? Could Rahul take half of the money every single month? About a thousand bucks a month in cash flow? Sure. We can go spend it. We can go use it towards buying more properties. It really doesn't matter. So in this case, Miss Mary had a vent joint venture with us where she was getting a fixed return. That's another type of a joint venture, right? And then we have a long-term joint venture partnership. So be between Rahul and I, I think we own 150, 160 properties, something like that, right? And those are all rental properties. And what do we do? Every single, at the time initially when I started, I needed Rahul because he had a good job with Caterpillar. He had a W-2. He had some uh, money saved up from a home equity, actually, from his house. So I partnered with him, not because he put in any time, not because he was putting in any effort initially. He had a full-time job. I needed him because I needed somebody to refinance properties. At the time, I couldn't get the kind of loans that are available today. So the whole point of joint ventureship, if you don't take anything away, take this away, that you partner with people because one plus one is not two. One plus one results into 11, right? Meaning what I'm trying to say is this, that the part, point of partnership is not to double something if there are two people. The point is to multiply and grow much bigger than what you can do by yourself. Again, remember, if you want to get a copy of the flipping partnership uh, agreement, if you want to get a copy of the uh, joint ventureship for cash flow properties, meaning rental properties, make sure when you're there at the three day that you pick that up from Lori and she will have it for you for everybody that does not know. Uh, I'm going to forget the date. February 24th, 25th, and 26th is when we're doing the three day event. So if you haven't registered, make sure you register. And having said that, we'll wrap up for today. Again, a reminder, if you're not a uh, member of the Borough Cashflow Group, become a member, be a part of it, and invite lots of your friends and family. And remember, you have a great chance of winning uh, the prize. This time the prize is a vacation, uh, a cruise for two, you and your spouse, um, and it is a cruise for two. So if you invite a lot of people, you have a statistical odd of winning, a higher statistical odd of winning. Having said that, guys, thank you very much. And we will talk to you on Friday.